voting capability, of course, I need to have a little post. <laughs> so um, I'm going to add uh, another new project for this, and it's going to be a console application. I'm going to call this simply console host. Okay. Console host is going to reference um, the, uh, the address manager. Okay. And being that as it may, I'm going to say address manager dot runtime dot start console console dot right line press enter to exit console dot read it's not a very sophisticated post, right? But I need it later. Um, runtime stop. Okay? So that's my little console host. The fun thing is, I'm going to add a new project. I'm not going to really install it, but just, just to show you how uh, that uh, code works. That is truly interesting. Where is that damn template? It's here. A Windows service host, right? Windows service. And here's why I'm creating this little indirection of a uh, runtime <clears throat> host because uh, now I can go here and on start, I can go and say address manager runtime start. No, Jackie, that was not BB. <laughs> Which means now I've unified the whole runtime story into, you know, make it a console host, make it a Windows service, make it whatever you, you want because now I have a unified start stop thing. I can do whatever I want. Okay? So I have a Windows service host, I have a console host, the console host is the thing that I want to uh, use. Uh, or set a startup project. And. Running it, uh huh. Unblock, runs, let's go and let's try. Local host 808. Hmm. Did I call this 80 Yeah. Yes, right. I always get confused whether that's really slash or whether it's not a slash. Let's, let's try that again. I'm using an obsolete version. Look at that. Look at how much of an old fashioned that obviously have. Yeah. That looks good. I'm just using it to see that there's actually stuff coming out of it. I, I would never use the HTTP channel for loading because that's just that's just wrong. Uh, because it does, it does RPC uh, encoded and that's old style. So if we don't want to do this, typically I would do the TCP channel, but just to prove that it's working. I use the HTTP channel so we can actually hit it uh, without actually writing clients to it. Because I'm focusing on the server side. What do I care about clients? Um, so it's doing all this wacky stuff that it does for RPC encoding, all those things, but the point is the channel works. Um, interesting thing is, is now we have this thing listening on um, this port, and of course at the same time um, this thing still works, and this gives me the, uh, the proper um, service contract. So I have a doc literal proper service here, and I have a TCP communication channel with remoting as well. Since I already got 
questions in the break about you know the feasibility of remoting for that kind of thing. Um, I would never expose a, a th anything through a remoting channel. Um, remoting is is thought to be um, since they never really got it done a great way to communicate across app domains, right? It's the only way to create to communicate across app domains. With TCP now or with the TCP channel now, there's a secure channel, so it actually does security. It does authentication, all those things, so it becomes a more feasible option. It remains that there's better options to communicate across, <coughs> across the wire. And if you communicate using remoting in this style without, without events, not setting properties, so you do it not in a distributed object way, but more in a service-oriented way, then remoting is an okay, is an option, right, for now. Um, but you shouldn't be going wild with distributed objects. Distributed objects have failed for a reason. We're doing web services for a reason. We're doing web service because Corba and DCOM had limited limited use. They never scaled across the land, and that's not because the the, the transports don't. That's mostly because the, the the implementation style of distributed objects, where everything is tightly coupled to each other, um, is simply not suiting the wide area network scenario because you make things automatically too chatty. If you design it like a web service, well then that's a bit, a bit of a different story. Now I'm going to evolve this puppy. And now I'm going to evolve this puppy. We have now we have three hosts, right, for the same sort of application. We have an enterprise services service, we have a services host, a Windows service host, we have a console host, and we have this this uh, web service host. They're all well different different hosting environments. Now I'm going to consolidate. Now I'm going to consolidate the 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 runtime for this application into one runtime, and then I'm going to do using the application server that's part of Windows. Yes, there is one. It's called Complus. Complus Enterprise Services. It's not legacy. It's a good thing, and it's the application server that is currently shipping. Right? Indigo and all those things are future, future. Well, nine months, probably. But Enterprise Services is still valid and it's good. To make this work with, with Enterprise Services, I'm going to go here and I'm going to first sign the assembly. So I'm going to create a strong name. Uh, Fine. Got that done. And uh, in the properties, um, since I really don't want to expose everything to the rest of the world, uh, it's come visible fault, and that's a good thing, right? We don't want to register everything in as enterprise service because enterprise service needs a little bit of an interaction with com, right? At least the classes need to be exposed, the interfaces need to be exposed, so we can use enterprise services services or complus services on them, which is not which doesn't mean that that the traffic actually happens through interop. What's happening, and this is why I'm using remoting here, um, as as started up with remoting, enterprise services tunnels remoting calls um, through a DCOM channel. There's Two methods, as you're just going to see in Compute Services Explorer in a moment, um, that are being used to dispatch those calls. So I'm really telling remotely. The only thing I need to expose is the, the interfaces and the, the, the service classes. The thing I'm, I don't need to expose is the message classes and all those things, because they're never going to be visible to COM. They're only going to be visible to, to the application to manage clients. You can make them available to VB6 uh, clients, for instance, if you were exposing the message classes um, also as com objects. We're not going to do that in this, in this case because we're going to stay in the managed world. So to do that, to make it work, I'm going to write load class. So this is messed up as well. I'm going to call this now properly the address manager. Oh, well, let's call that service. The address manager service is going to be a public class, and that's going to be derived from service component. Okay. 
do we already have, we don't. We don't. So let's add the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful system of enterprise service. My favorite assembly of all times. Before system of service model came along. I'm sorry, enterprise services. And uh, of course, on that class, I'm going to implement from our contract the very same interface. Okay. For the moment, I'm just going to return <coughs> the new thing, right? So I'm, I'm re-implementing the same thing. We're going to, we're going to fix that too. Um, and the enterprise service service component, I'm going to make come visible. So that's the thing I want to expose. Um, and in addition, I'm going to make this uh, just time activated. And uh, I'm going to make this puppy auto complete. So that's sort of a proper small enterprise service, service component. Uh, that being as it may, uh, I need to, I'm now going to compile it, just to, let's look at what's happening. There's one build failure. Unable to copy the file, that's understandable. Okay, and I'm going to go to my contract and go to definition. This is how I navigate. And I'm going to make this come visible true as well. Oh, well, we're not quite done yet. Um, my runtime here is something that I'm just going to keep around the way it is for the time being. Uh, I'm going to add another class. And we can still consolidate those things, but I just want to make it a little clearer. Um, this is the process initializer. I'm going to call this, just to make clear, the ES process. No. I'm going to call this main. <coughs> main is a service component that implements a special interface that's provided by enterprise services, and that is process, I process initializer. I process initializer gives us, look at that, a shutdown method and a startup method, which fits, which suits our purpose here really well, and which is automatically called as this application is starting up. And with that, I'm going to call our um, address rec manager runtime start. So, oh, stop, sorry. Yep. They always come out in the wrong order, and the main reason for that is simply that that's the alphabetical order. And start. Okay? So with that, we do have a, an entry point, just as we have with the console application, just as we have with the enterprise services application, the same sort of entry point into our, into our enterprise services app. In the application, in the service metadata, I'm now making clear to enterprise services that, in fact, I want this to be an enterprise services application. So uh, let's add the system enterprise services near space right here. And I say application activation. Activation option is now a server. Okay, so that's my enterprise services app. I'm going to compile the whole thing. That's fine. <coughs> Looks good. Did I forget anything? Yes. Because our main needs to be come visible. <coughs> Let's try registering that puppy. Services Explorer. 
there's a bunch of here's our address manager now properly registered as a com plus component containing our address manager service and our address manager main right the interfaces available here are address man i the, our address manager service that's a oh where am i uh, that's the interface that's automatically generated and uh, i have a i remote dispatch and the i remote dispatch class is um, the one where actually the, the decom tunneling happens through it has two methods remote dispatch auto done or remote dispatch not auto done that all depends on whether you have the autocomplete uh, attribute set or not and this gets a BSDR and returns a BSDR. An automation string. The automation string is abuse though, um, in that it's not a string, but actually only the marshalling capabilities of OLA aught 32 are used. In that the length, the length D word that uh, is in front of the BSDR is set to the length of the remoting package, which is then serialized out in the rest, in the rest of the bytes of the BSDR. Right? So it's just using a marshalling trick. But this is how the remoting package, which is created by the enterprise services uh, a module for since inside the Complus runtime, how that tunnel is remoting. So it is really using the CLR, CLR to CLR calls properly to call those services. So now with that, I should be able to go and Started and I can't. Hmm. Because security is enabled. Let's let's disable security for a moment. Okay. What was that? Well, of course, since we're running a multi-channel app. <clears throat> Uh, the puppy would, if I had done the right thing, I, I have to still have, would have to put it into the GAC, right? Um, would pull up the remoting thing, but what you can see is you were getting an exception, meaning it is listening to that port, which is the main point of, of demonstrating for the moment, just for the sake of brevity, right? So it is listening to COM, it's listening to ECOM, it's listening to remoting. Can it, how do we how do we make it listen to web to the web services program? <coughs> There's two ways. One I already foreshadowed, <coughs> which is a rather evil trick, and I'm not sure yet about the implications of that and what that really means. But. I'm setting the enterprise service to service component as the implementation of the web service. Mild laughter in the crowd. View in browser. The fun thing is, see, it's saying, oh, I can't do this right now because there's no namespace name because the service component, this is sort of proof that it's using the service component now because we're missing the attribute on the service component. Let's stop the application. Okay, now let's stop. Now I can go and recompile. Let's go and uh, go back to the address manager. Uh, let's go to the implementation. Let's go and steal this puppy here. And let's put that right here. Does that look sick? <laughs> it probably does. It, but it turns out to be working, which is uh, <clears throat> not a bad thing at all. OK. Compiled. Start again. Boy. OK. One class. Decom transport, TCP transport, 
Web services transport. That doesn't suck, I think. Of course, we have no client, but trust me, trust me, the clients work. One thing, one thing that's broken about, while I'm at it, right? One thing that's broken about this is, of course, that we're getting this final found exception. The reason is, enterprise services applications, need, enterprise services uh, assemblies need to go into the DAC, right? Must. Documentation says so. Oops. It's untrue. Oh, let's stop it. <coughs> I'm going to shut it down. And into the address manager, I'm going to add a configuration file. Because every good application should, of course, have an application configuration file. Where are you? App config. Likewise, I'm going to add, and uh, if you allow, I'm just going to cheat. Because I have so many, so many of those floating around, I always forget how they work. Let's say, in theory, I have so many floating around. Drei, zwei, eins, okay. Let's go and find one. Uh, sorry for boring you. It wasn't my intent. There it is. I need to have an application about manifest file. App.com is always copied automatically. This we're going to copy. Uh, always to the target directory. That's fine. So I uh, compile now. What I'm getting you is need a, name it? huh? You need to rename the manifest to match the config. Actually, I do not. Um, however, what I need to do is so here's my bin debug directory. I get an address manager .config, which is almost, almost right. And I get an application .manifest, which is correct. Um, what I need to do in addition to that, I need to do a little trick here. I need to do a little build event, <coughs> which after the fact is gonna say copy Y, and then it's gonna take from the project path, And I'm always questioning myself whether that's right, the right thing to do. Project path and no, it's the project dir target dir. Right? So from the project dir, the app.config file is going into the target dir application.config, and that's important. Does it look right? That looks right. Okay. So it doesn't have to be named the application. They, the names just have to match. No, it has to be application.config. It must be. For that particular thing I'm going to do right now, it has to be. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, our target directory, since is now the address manager, this is actually where we have registered the, the, the application. So that's our directory. Let's go and get that directory. Because now I need it. Because now I'm going to do an incredible stunt, and I'm going to go and go to the um, activation tab here, and I'm going to enter an application root directory. Bin debug. And set that. With setting this directory and having exactly those two files, the application.config and application.manifest files, the CLR or enterprise services will host the CLR on that directory, eliminating the need to put anything into the gap. Works for Windows XP, Complus 1.5, and for Windows Server 2003, Complus 1.5. So with that, now, Let's go and start the application again. And 
see there, that is actually fixing our uh, remoting issue, meaning now I actually have three working channels for that, which is good. MSMQ. For MSMQ, of course, we have messages, which poses a wholly different problem, right? I'm going to, uh, probably, probably there's going to be, there's going to be one person in the room who's now saying, hey, that feels not, hey, that feels <laughs> not the way, the way what I'm doing. That feels not designed for that. But now what I need is for incoming messages, for incoming messages to be dispatched in a certain way. Um, for, 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 um, for system of messaging, I'm actually going to show you the client side of it um, so you see how that works. Um, we're assuming at this point we're not responding. So this is a, since MSMQ is very specific, right? It's a one-way technology. We're simply going to assume that uh, we're not going to send a response to this create to the create operation we're currently doing, right? We're not going to we're going to we're not going to send a response. We're simply going to be okay with it. Typically, I would I would design it a little different, right? So we have an update method that doesn't that is void that doesn't yield a return <coughs> message. So. MSMQ is not the same thing as, as all the other response things that we have here. So it's a little bit of a, of a it's not the same thing, right? It's a one-way channel, so it's a one-way channel thing. So to make this work, I'm going to go to our uh, address manager runtime. And in our address manager runtime, what I need to do is I need to go and listen to something. I'm going to say public static. Void receive messages. And I'm going to say static thread <laughs> listener thread. I'm just going to make one. The listener thread. <coughs> the listener thread is a new thread with, of course, a thread start, and that's received messages. Mind that in C Sharp 2.0, you no longer need to create the, 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 the wrapper around the delegate, it just figures it out all by itself. So we're going to create the new thread. I'm going to say listener thread dot start. Of course, I want to be yeah. While we're at it, I'm going to make a manual reset event. Stop listener. Right. That's I'm going to initialize that right here. It's initialized to false. Um, and I'm going to start that puppy here and stop. I'm going to say, uh, well, how did I call it? Stop listener. Dot sets and listener thread dot join with a reasonable timeout, time span from seconds 30. Okay. Now we have this loop. The loop goes and <coughs> gets a message queue. Um, that's existing. We're, we're simply assuming it's some queue. Some private. Let's let's make this. Let's for the sake of of, of making this simple. Uh, let's say that's sitting on my machine. System dot environment. Environment dot machine name. Plus. Service pack two, that's gone. 
with XP that no longer works. I've done that for a long time, and since Herb's F2, that will refuse opening the queue. Who would have missed that? Huh? For me, for two. This talk, yes, but oh, Vista, it does. Well, at Service Pack 2, uh, XP2, I have issues with that. Okay. Why not use queued components while we're on the subject? Because queued components creates a domain, uh, it creates a domain requirement for me. You have have to have domain and domain user accounts. Okay. Otherwise, queued components don't work. That's why I'm not using queued components. Queued components have too much. Requires so much setup, have so high setup requirements that they're almost infeasible to use. They're a wonderful technology, but it's just hard to deploy them. It, I mean, it's inc incredibly hard to deploy them. On the other hand, this method is using uh, message listener, using and? a different thread. Means that How's that bad? It's bad because your thread will die and you will not know that it happened. Oh, why, why, why would that be? Poison messages. Poison messages. No, no, I'm handling. I'm, look, my real listener has poison message handling. Okay. See, I'm thinking of all of that stuff. Poison message handling is not that hard. Uh, it is. No, it's not. <laughs> Experience. <laughs> Ten years of working with them, and then some kid tells me. No, poison message handling. Me poison messages will kill your channels every time. No, you'll they find, won't. You'll find a stupid programmer that will find a way to. No, no, you just need to. You need to build use a generic, a generic listener. And the DLQ, and still, you will find the creative way. No, I have a listener that has that exposes one thing, and that's a book, that's a delegate you could hook in, and I hide all the poison message handling for everybody. Okay. This thing never dies. I can guarantee you. I've done very bad things with it. Okay. How about just some some guy who's a voice <laughs> of red? Who sits, who sits inside and aborts my thread, if they do that, if I catch them, You'll kill them. they're fired. <laughs> yeah. And that's as easy as it is. Well, true. Oops. <coughs> well, true. Um, I'm going to say uh, message is mq. Receive, and then of course I can go and uh, make a reasonable timeout. And of course I would have to specify this uh, writing a robust message list. There's not, nothing I'm going to go with and I, I can really do on stage, right? So I'm just going to I'm just going to fake it a little bit. I would have to say, actually I would have to say begin receive, get the synchronization token, synchronize the signal. Let's do that. Okay, so MQ begin receive. That's the proper way to do that. Um, I'm going to give it. A I don't have actually have to use a timeout because now I'm doing it. Now I'm it, doing it in the asynchronous way. I'm getting the iasync result. Uh, I'm using I'm using this, this, a separate thread as well. So I'm doing a begin receive, and now I'm going to go and say. Um, wait handle dot wait any for the result dot async wait handle comma uh, no I have to create an array let's do that you wait handle oops, oops. I should simply type. I'm too. I'm, I'm getting too lazy these days with those things. Um, so the as, async wait handle of, of that, and then I'm going to go and get the how do I call it? Stop listener. That's my my manual resentment, which will abort me, right? And uh, I don't really need to set a timeout, so that's fine. And the result of wait any is the wait handle that stopped me. So if <laughs> Wait handle equals zero. If that's the one that stopped me, then I have a message. Else, I don't. Would you agree? So I can break out of the loop. I can terminate. So otherwise, I have a message. So I can say on the queue mq and receive. Pass in the result, which gives me the message. Thank you. 
So here I have my message. Now, how do I dispatch to my application? The trick is, we're going to abuse the label. Okay? This is the way how you send into it. You simply say, all right, you know what? Switch, and of course, this is something we're going to, we would externalize. Right? Switch, message dot label. And if that message label, and of course also the strings is something we would probably declare in a little different way, if that is create address or class name dot you can you can you can use whatever you like, right? In that case, I'm gonna say fine. I'm gonna create a scope, you don't have to, but I'm doing it for clarity reasons. I'm gonna create, I'm gonna uh, put on the message that has a formatter, and that formatter is going to be a new XML message formatter of the type of uh -huh, <clears throat> the create address request for my contract. So I'm using the exact same type that I'm sending in through SOAP, and through the SOAP body, I'm sending that through MZQ. Uh, which means when I've set the formatter, I can actually now simply grab that input thing and that's message.body as, that's as simple as this, contract dot request. You can actually write a, uh, a, a wrapper, a generic wrapper around this. Hmm? Uh, request, it's the input. See what we're getting, and now I can I can I can pick it I can pick an instance. I'm going to say using uh, address manager service SVC equals new address manager service, and with that I say SVC create address, and I'm simply throwing my request, and that's how I've done the the mapping to Amazon Q. And I can I can reuse the same types. Now what I should be now what I should be doing is uh, basically just take that here, the inner switch, and uh, go and take that out. So now this is received messages back at this back, and I'm gonna call this dispatch. Uh, this patch now looks like this. Of course, what we can also do is uh, uh, we could we could put this into the delegate. We could have a generic message handler. We're not going to do this. So it's this patch message input. So we have this generic. We have the receive messages. Is a little generic message message view listener, and that's that's how we do the mapping to Amazon Q. On the sender side, it's the same thing, right? You basically you basically go and. And this is what you would do to send. And this is just illust for illustration purposes. And uh, therefore, I'm going to put this into, into the docs, uh, which now lo no longer works because I've done the reset. Um, and sending it would be mq send. I think I need help. mq.send. And that would be going to send the message. So that's just a request object, comma. And then there's one overload where I can actually set the label. Here we go. Um, and for that, you actually don't have to set the XML formatter explicitly because it's implicitly done. And so you say create uh, address here in this case. And that's all you need to do to send. You, but the one thing we neglected here is to set the right transaction mode, which would be based on the transaction mode of the queue, actually. So, but that's as easy as it is to program against MSM queue, and then we match this, map this out to our uh, existing thing. That was channel four. That was easy enough, right? MSQ listener, all these things, and it works. And it's look, it's multi-threaded. It, it'll actually do. It'll jump out of. Uh, it'll jump out of the wait time. It's going to wait. It's going to block. It's very small. It's very. It's it's uh, very compact as as a little listener. And if you want to handle, if you want to add. Poison, if you want to add poison handling, that's fairly easy. One thing we should probably do here is um, to, uh, to make sure this doesn't tank. Um, 
I can go and uh, simply absorb log and then simply absorb all exceptions here. Just a proper thing to do, right? Here, just put, put a logging thing, trace, trace the error. Trace error x dot not to string <coughs> to make it easy. And then you can put a trace list around this and see whether things go bad, who's who's responsible for that and all that. Okay. We have, we have three types of hosts that we can pick from. We have an enterprise services host. Um, we can you can you can host either remote you can you host as as web service, you can host as remoting, you can host as enterprise service, you basically have all options. It's it's really once you have, have an approach like this, once you organize things in a meaningful way and you think about it as, as a service-oriented thing, and you make it suit all of those different transports, and this, this is why I have the message, right? The, the message class I'm using because, first of all, it gives us looser coupling in terms of parameters, but also I can, I can drop that into the queue as it stands and simply go grab it out and just forward into, forward into my call. I don't have to do any copying, I just use the same sort of sort of um, things. So, that being as it is, we still have our address manager implementation, which is still a Marshall Ref object. So that's our, that's our remoting object that we expose. I could also expose, so I have my web service that I expose, and that's now a service component, which I'm not sure whether that's a smart thing to do. Uh, I have my, my implementation here, my address manager implementation. It may make sense to actually say, all right, if we want to have enterprise services and this, this sort of implementation, the remoting class, all at the same thing, Achim said, never host business logic on the edge, right? And he's right with that. What we should do, something that I'm not going to do now, is we, have to, we should refactor this into an internal class which doesn't have any of those attributes and any of those things, right? This is really where the business logic is coming. The business logic is going to go into, into an internal class, and this, and this is being called by all the other things. Good. Be that as, as it is, I will go and change this slightly, because I need, since I need the implementation, I'm actually going to host the service component as a remoting component, which I can. Uh, you can host service components on remoting, and that's perfectly fine. So you can call them from through the remoting channel, channel insecure, and through the enterprise services channel. Um, that's a good thing to compare because you'll see that um, enterprise services and DCOM blow remoting out of the water by order of magnitudes if you do it right. Uh, because we need to have the implementation. The implementation is very plain. Let's. Not make this a Marshall Web object. Let's, let, let's just make this uh, an address manager. Um, and into our runtime class, I'm going to add a little thing. I will say in start, in addition to our listener thread that listens on MSMQ, which I'm going to disable for the reason that I don't have that queue. So it's for illustrative purposes, not because I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be working but it distracts from the main interaction. Under this, I'm going to go and build, first of all, declare it up here. I'll declare static service host. The service host is the ego thing. And uh, enter service host. And in start, I'm going to instantiate it just like remoting, very similar to what I'm doing with all the other technologies. I could actually do that also in entirely in config. I'm just I'm not going to do that now. I'm going to say new service host for the type address manager impl. That's just a plain class. I'm going to open the service host here. And here I'm going to close the service host.
in my application configuration file, I then have to add, and I could do this, I could do this all by hand, just for the purpose of, of having um, this work or just making my life a little easier. I'm going to add a system that service model configuration section where I'm going to say, all right, we're going to host some services or one service. Uh, the service is um, of the type address manager, ooh, address manager dot address manager equal comma address manager. That's our assembly. And uh, that particular service exposes an endpoint, and now I can really pick, right? I can say, you know, make this HTTP, make this net TCP, make this whatever our transport <coughs> individual has. So let's say I'm going to make this HTTP localhost 809 ADDR. Sounds reasonable. And we need also contract um, because everything is explicit in Indigo. So here, it's not as implicit in, with enterprise services or with remoting. Here, I really need to say, I want to host this interface. It's not automatically all interfaces are exposed. Explicit boundaries, so I need to explicitly host the interface. So that will be address manager dot contract dot i address manager, also from the assembly address manager. And I need to have a binding. And binding, as I explained, is the thing that takes the address and binds it to that respective contract. And we will use the basic, boy, those things change so, change, change so quickly. Now I need to go and cheat. Uh, yeah, that's the current name of it. basic HTTP binding, which is that, all right? So I'm going to take this configuration and just for, to make it simple, ah, that should work. So. Now, of course, this is ambiguous because system.service model and system. Uh, messaging both have a message. And of course, this is no longer a much more object. And this bastard doesn't like it either. What is that? Hey, the XML message formatter takes what? It takes a type off, doesn't it? Oh, oh, it takes a type of array, see? And we still have one. I have to copy because the thing is still running. Now I'm curious. I have I've, I've not, a five-channel a five hosted app, I've not done yet. See, I'm just making this up as I sit here, because I'm enjoying myself. Totally. And I have you watching over my shoulder, which is a fun thing to do. Okay. Run, baby, run. Did you compile? Yes. So, start. Server execution failed. Why is that? How do you, how do we find that out? There's two ways to do that. First of all, we could look here. Mm, that's not much help. The second way to do this is to go to Complus 
and go and tell the administrator, dude, you know what? Advanced launch a puppy and debugger. Now let's look at it. No! <laughs> I trust the I trust the PDB files. I think that service model is a little unhappy. That would be my guess. Slowly simple. See, debugging is also a skill, so I'm not I'm not really unhappy about it. Please, now, finally. See, that's the problem with opening, with opening the, new, the new instance of it. If this doesn't work, I'm going to fall back to my console host, which is the reason why I did that. All right, I think <coughs> the decision has just been made. For my console host, I need to have, of course, now also an application configuration file. And since I really don't trust myself at new item application configuration file, I have, if I'm not entirely mistaken, I had put this onto the clipboard. So again, app config file. Let's put this here. Let's go and let's run the console host and see what's going on there. This debarter is not of the opinion that it really wants to do anything with me. <laughs> That's the problem with live. Things don't work on you. I think, I think it's, the, it, it's, it's a reasonable thing to think that it is indeed the little pad. It's, it's worrying me a little. Sitting with two dev ends. <laughs> Select columns. CPU. The old, the younger guy needs to go. Goodbye. Set to get contracted for I address, but the type is not a service contract. Ah, oh, of course. Look, look at me, idiot. And there were at least four people in the room who knew this and didn't tell me. Who are bastards? You are evil people. Of course, it's all my fault. The contract of I'm very happy actually that 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 happened. Uh, the contract needs to be marked up. It needs to be made a service contract because explicit boundaries, right? There's nothing being exposed unless you tell it to. Service contract. That's from that's from service model, and just like with web method, you need to say this here is an operation contract. Try that again. And. Local host, 809. Uh, 
Um, that's a problem with my particular build. That is expected. So it listens on remoting. It listens, it indigo listens, right? And now we're going to go for the big test. hosted application. It's using Indigo, the new stuff. And I can actually go, and now, now that I have the Indigo capability, I can go and go, go through the whole policy story. I can use I can use all sorts of, all the transports that Indigo is using. And through adding service contract, and through having the XML serializer markup on all those files, it will use the XML serializer contract, because it, it, those classes are not marked as data contract, meaning It'll, it'll fall back to XML serialization and they're properly marked up. So it's going to use that. So now we have a, a structure that I built which not only easily migrates to Indigo, it actually co-hosts on all those different technologies. And, and if you would really want to stretch it, you could actually, you could actually have it all converge to a service component. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the, my time has run out because I would show you the trick for the client side. The client side trick is very simple. To make to make all these to make all these things work right for the client, we have a bit of we have a bit of an issue, right? First of all, we need that interface. That interface is shared. That goes into an assembly. Make an assembly called my interface. Copying that assembly from A to B in a web services world is no problem, as long as you don't require that anybody is using an updated version when you update. Right? So I release version 1 for my web service, and I give it to you. And you get, you get that interface. And actually, let me do that for the web service, just, just to make sure that you know what, I'm do, what I mean. You will, you will be building something like this for the for the client side, and you want to be so because you want to be using interfaces, and in the same way. So how do you do this? Starting with web services. Web services is the thing that is automatically generating code, right? So that's 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 the issue right there. I would go and do the following thing. I would say add web reference, web service in this solution. Let's go and. Get that. This is the service I want to reference. Um, and I hope it doesn't. There we go. So this is my address service proxy there state. Add reference. And now I want to make I want to build, of course, what I want to build is I want to build a factory. I will never want to instantiate this proxy directly from my code, but I rather want to build a factory. And the factory basically looks at config, at some config that I have, and then says, all right, we're going to take the remoting path, we're going to take the indigo path, we're going to take this and this and this path based on that interface. So how do I get an interface? Um, the great thing about ASP.NET Web Services is that it does base the, pick the right thing and you'll be happy, that it does, um, Partial classes. So, evil trick. And we want, of course, we want to we want to be able to update to do to accept update web reference. It shouldn't. So we can't really touch that particular generated file. So, I'm going to do an evil trick. First of all, I'm going to say uh, refactor extract interface. I'm going to say fine. That here is the method I want. Not the whole assing stuff. Not interesting. <clears throat> right? URL. Mm, no, that's just, that's just specific. So 
So you can like extract that. I have an interface, I address manager service, that's something I can start with. That thing happens to be pretty compatible with the server side thing. Right? So if we import the server side thing, that's just fine. We don't have to do this step. What we will do is we're going to say, look, we're going to say public partial class uh, address manager <coughs> proxy. Uh, no, address manager, what's what's the damn name? Address manager service, that's the proxy. Service, colon, I, address manager service. That's all really what we need to do here at this point. Simply getting the, we're getting the interface in, and with that, I'm going to go and uh, update the, ref the reference. Now it's gone. And now, using the partial class, I'm actually adding this interface declaration, this interface inheritance to that class, right? But the web service proxy is implementing it. Now, with this, so so with this trick, I can infuse an interface base class of my liking into the web service proxy as long as it's compatible. So um, what I'm doing now, so this was the extract method. What I'm doing now is I'm basically uh, what I'm. I'm taking the source code, or I'm taking the reference, my little interface assembly, right? I'm taking one of the two, and I'm reference, I'm, I'm instrumenting, sort of infusing my web service proxy with that. And so, with the help of soap suds for remoting, right? With with the help of referencing the service component assembly or the interfaces. Uh, and by writing a little proxy, all of a sudden I have also this multi-path thing on the client side. And of course for Indigo, I need that interface as well. So this works on the server side as well as on um, the client side. It's about thinking a little bit about the commonalities of all those things. It's, it's basically converging on a service model. Right? It's converging on the constraints of writing services. But you really can write complete service-oriented application with your, your choosing of services. Where you can say, all right, for this connection, I need to have a one-way path. For this connection, I need to have request response with tra where transactions need to flow. Uh, for this path, I need to have um, quick, you know, on-machine communication where it doesn't, where it doesn't really matter um, what the security is, and I want to have a low impact. Or I need to have a web service thing. You can pick that now and just implement it in a clever way. And, and you can pick the transport pretty much through config and through a little external code that you write. With Indigo, you can pretty much forget all those other <laughs> things because Indigo is going to bring that with it. The, Indigo, the little Indigo service that I wrote here, of course, is only an HTTP <coughs> thing right now. But you can do automatic transactions as you can do with, it, with, with enterprise services. You can do just-in-time activation kind of thing, as you can do with enterprise services. You have interoperable web services, as you do have, as you do have with ASP.NET. So the model that I'm that I'm that I'm, that I'm showing you is completely Indigo aligned. The goal here is to have a, a, a solution for all the current technologies and all the additional code, all those additional concerns that I have in the runtime class and all those things, you can simply take them out, wipe them away, and simply leave the core, our impl class here, uh, which turns out to be, uh, so this here, our impl class here, which turns out to be the real Indigo service, right? All the other stuff you can go simply throw away. It's just additional stuff. And now you go and get your copy, yourself a copy of CodeSmith and uh, write a template that just generates all this, all this mess and you're done. And then you can write sort of Indigo applications today. The existing stack is all there and it's not so far <coughs> apart as we think. Um, and as, if Indigo comes along, you can use the Indigo, Indigo infrastructure and that Indigo infrastructure will just consolidate queuing. Uh, Enterprise services capabilities, remoting capabilities, web service capabilities, all in one stack. It's going to do the binding. The bindings are going to do 
automatically all the things that I have to do externally right now. If you want to send messages for MSMQ, define the binding, define the queues, the listener is going to spin up inside of Indigo, you don't have to, you have to take care of it. Things you have to do explicitly here, you no longer have to do. However, it's doable, it's not rocket science, I was able to do this in, well, between when we started and now, with a break in between, it's a fairly complete uh, implementation of all those patterns. I'm going to post a. Uh, uh, do you have Do you have a website? You, uh, uh, yeah? yeah. Okay. So uh, on both on both uh, user group websites, we're going to post that zip file so you can get at it, um, and uh, then you can investigate it and uh, you know pick what you like of it. And that concludes the show. Thank you very much for. Your Uh, any more questions? If you leave now, it will only take you 30 minutes to reach yes. <laughs> All right. I'll jump over the window.